Welcome to Solar Impulse. Uh, this is a hangout on air. We've got a whole bunch of Georgia Tech grads, uh, electrical, mechanical, and chemical engineers, and of course, Andre Borschberg uh, and also Bertrand Picard, but Andre Borschberg, who will be uh, chatting with them and answering some questions. And so without further ado, perhaps, Andre, you'd uh, like to say a little ho hello to everyone. Yes, of course. Great pleasure talking to you from Monaco, from the control center. I hope Bertrand is hearing us. And in fact, if Bertrand is hearing us and can talk, he can interrupt us anytime. Uh, you will have priority, Bertrand, because I don't think you will stay all the time. But it's a pleasure talking to you guys and uh, looking forward to share and uh, discuss uh, different different questions, different issues that you'd like to, uh, to address uh, today. And it's a pleasure to say hello to my friend Leopold. And uh, I'm looking forward to see you personally again. Hope you will make, make it in Abu Dhabi when you arrive, or maybe in Sevilla when Bertrand lands there. I will. Very Excellent. good. Maybe Leopold, you can uh, start with the with the first question. Yeah, uh, André, you you disappeared from my radar, radar screen in Hawaii for technical reasons, and I talked to my friends at Georgia Tech, and saying maybe you bright engineers can contribute to solutions of the problem. They asked me indeed, but what was the problem? Could you help us to understand what happened there? Radar screen in uh, in in Hawaii. That's true. Huh? We, we 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 stopped for a while. Yes, but uh, I think there was diff different reasons for that. Uh, you may have heard that we had some technical issues last year. Uh, in fact, it was not so much about technologies, but more about how we used the technology. Uh, and we were quite restricted, you know, in the in the way we were flying the airplane. And I think we uh, went over the envelope that we designed uh, the airplane for. And uh, we, for safety reasons, decided to change the batteries. So suddenly, in fact, uh, we uh, we went underground for a while, if I can put it this way. Uh, but you also have to realize that we uh, uh, that it took two months to cross this ocean. Uh, that it was an extreme challenge for, I think, for the entire team, uh, put a lot of pressure on the engineers because, of course, nobody knew if it was really feasible, if the aircraft had the performance to do it, if we had the right strategy as a, as a pilot also, as a control center to make it feasible. So uh, every day we decided to postpone, not because we, you know, we were uh, not ready to take the risk, but we, we didn't find a solution which was uh, good enough to allow this airplane to go with the ocean. There is no way to go back, so uh, when you go, it's like Bertrand now, you know, flying over the Atlantic. Uh, he's committed for three days, and you better be sure that the choice you make are the right choice, because if not, you can be in a corner, and it's very difficult to, uh, to get out of it. So that was the situation last year. And this true after two months, we were, we were pretty exhausted at the same time, so uh, I don't want to say we were happy to have you know a technical issue, but in some ways you know everything came together at the same time. But, uh, can you tell me in your technical issues what was the major concern for you? Was it materials, energy storage, uh, solar cells, energy management? What what was it? Um, it, it it was uh, it it was it was batteries huh? mostly uh, mostly the question related to batteries because uh, we uh, we didn't we decide not to have a cooling system uh, and the reasons why we decide not to have a cooling system is that you know any system that you introduce in an airplane can fail so you have a risk of failure that's and you try to eliminate in fact all this risk. Uh, we had a very good insulation, you know, with a foam which was uh, developed uh, by Solvay and, uh, and Covestro, uh, which was maybe so good that, you know, it insulated the batteries too well. And finally, I had to do, uh, at the same time, leaving Japan, a test flight, uh, so going up and down and charging, discharging these batteries, and uh, followed immediately in the same flight by five days, five nights really over exceeded what the airplane was designed for. So we went close to the limits in terms of temperature and for safety reasons we decided to change all the batteries because you don't want to take risk. We fly over cities 
we land on the major airports and we really don't want to be uh, taken by surprise with a, a product with a you know uh, an equipment which is out of safety zones there but interestingly finally these batteries are all fine eh? we tested them we looked at them so uh, we can use them again maybe they have a lower capacity but uh, it was safe I think really to, to do it so not a problem with technology I think that's very important to understand huh? this clean tech this renewable energy works really well I mean you know touch wood because Bertrand is currently in the air so uh, I, I hate to say this you know when we are flying but but so uh, we were very happy with the choices it was the way we used them which created the issue Okay. Excellent, and I think uh, I'm going to interrupt you, Leopold. We've got some current students, I think, at Georgia Tech. Um, Dylan, who is an electrical engineer or studying electrical engineering, and Haley, uh, who is studying mechanical engineering. I hope that I got that right. And uh, so, do you guys have any questions for Andre? Um, yeah, I actually do have um, questions about like the characteristics of the plane to to keep it flying. Um, about how much energy, uh, roughly, does it does it take, or or do the solar panels have to collect to keep the plane in flight? It, de it depends when we fly. I mean, currently, uh, you know that it's uh, summer solstice, so it's an extremely favorable situation for us. Uh, we fly at 45 degrees north, where the days are longer and the nights shorter. Uh, so in a way we have surplus energy and the surplus energy allow us to fly uh, in April and uh, in, uh, in August, maybe early September. Now with the current design we cannot fly the entire year uh, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, we would need to have you know, higher performance to be able to, uh, to do this. And if you think about energy, uh, about a third is used to fly. Uh, to fly through the day. Another third is used to climb to 28,000 feet, roughly, and the last third is uh, used to fill up the batteries, which we will use during the night to fly something like 8 to 10 hours at, uh, at low altitude. So that's a little bit the way, in fact, you know, the energy is split between the, uh, the different use uh, of the airplane. Interesting. Excellent. And, and how did you come to those figures over time? Uh, so to, to, split, to split up the flight into the different stages, um, were those developed over time or did you have like a concept for it uh, in the planning stages of the, the plane's development? No, we, 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 we thought about it very carefully and we, in fact we built a lot of models uh, when we started the design of the airplane because we wanted to really understand what was going on and in fact, at the beginning, it was more really about uh, energy management than you know designing the right structure to build the airplane and to balance what happens during the day with what is happening during the night. So during the day, you collect energy and you store it. So in fact, you should collect enough or and not more. Uh, in relation to the storage device and uh, uh, during the night you have to make sure that you are so efficient that whatever you stored is enough to fly through the night and you have to do it for different seasons for different uh, places around the earth it's not the same over the equator that it is of course at 45 degrees north currently so you have to play with the models to understand uh, what is the envelope that you design the airplane for and uh, this leads, in fact, to the design that you that you choose. But knowing afterwards, you know, that the aerodynamics will change uh, the amount of energy you will consume. You have a bigger wing; it's maybe more efficient. You have also more solar cells, but it's heavier. So all this has to be played with, so that you really find the optimum based on the technology that you have available. Excellent, and Haley, do you have a do you have a question? Um, about the design of the plane, what, um, I guess, did you take into consideration as far as the seasons and the time of the day you were flying and, like, what did you have to do for that, for the design aspect? Uh, yes, of course, it, uh, it led to some choices. Uh, 
I think one choice we made um, was uh, an, an aerodynamic choice. I mean, we knew that by having a big wingspan, we would have a low sink rate. And again, in fact, you try to, to work out models which tells you how heavier is the airplane if the wingspan gets bigger. It's not a linear function, uh, so you really have to uh, to understand, in fact, the, the different relationship, and you play with this. And sometimes you have to test it, so we build some, some structure to see, in fact, how we could solve uh, and, and which kind of weight goals could be achieved. To make sure that the models we have really fits the uh, uh, fits the uh, fits the objective, and then we we have this we decided that you know if we fly between mid April to mid September, it would be long enough to be able to make the flight around the world. Uh, maybe last year, as you have seen, we waited so long that being in Hawaii early July made it not possible to continue afterwards over the Atlantic and back to Abu Dhabi. Uh, so you make choices, but of course, you know, when you're in an exploration project, you never know if they are right or wrong. Uh, so uh, we make a lot of assumptions, uh, and you have to live with this. Sometimes they are right, sometimes they are maybe too ambitious. Uh, so it's all about learning. And uh, interestingly, in fact, in this project, you know, on one side you have technology, which is, of course, very important. But on the other side, you have human beings, you have teams, you have spirit, you have uh, 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 mindset. I mean, the, you know, the kind of attitude that you have when you face problem, which is as important, I would say, as technologies, or even more important, because this leads you to the right or the wrong choices. Uh, in Berlin, Owen, uh, Stefan, I think it was Theodore. I'm not sure if I got that name right. And it looks like there's a fourth person in the in the room. I'm sorry about that. But yes, do any do you gentlemen have any have any questions? Yeah, we were just discussing it. It sounds like we're still a little bit off from booking our first flight across the Atlantic in a solar powered uh, airplane. But uh, from all the learnings that you guys have had uh, over this experience, you know, traveling around the world, what do you think are the first applications uh, that you see where this technology could be used, and what are the major challenges to having it more widespreadly adopted? No, you, you are right to say, you know, it's the same when Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic, people knew they could do it, but they had to become pilot first before being able to do it. Uh, I think you, you should look at this aircraft in different directions. I mean, on one side, we have technologies which makes it very energy efficient, and all these technologies can be used uh, in different applications. Simply making, you know, your homes more energy efficient, uh, simply designing uh, uh, transportation means also more efficient, uh, appliances which would use less electricity, less, uh, less energy. So the first goal of our partners, uh, companies like Solvay who joined the project uh, at the time, was to develop technologies which would provide their customers with energy efficient solutions. That's part of the message. But if you think about aviation, uh, you have to see this happen also uh, using two different uh, uh, technologies. I mean, on one side, it's electric propulsion. It's efficient electric propulsion. That's one. And second is the source of energy, which is solar. If you take the electric propulsion, uh, I think we, we, we start to be completely convinced that this has a great future in aviation. And it's interesting to see that since weeks or months, large companies are launching uh, research projects in this field. I think the last one is NASA, which uh, uh, presented the new project about uh, new uh, electric airplanes. It's not a big one, but it's interesting to listen to the quotes they made saying that, you know, it's not as flashy and as... Uh, uh, going through the sound barrier, something they did in 1948, but it's much more useful for humankind. So they believe that these technologies have a, have a great future and that they have to invest R&D in this direction. I think Airbus is working on it very actively, Boeing has project as well. 
So it's clear that electric propulsion is so interesting, but of course, assuming that we can store energy, which we start to be able to do this, it's so interesting that it will find its way into aviation, first in small aircrafts, then in you know larger one, and maybe ultimately in big one, but this is too early to say. Solar technology, it's different. I think, you know, the, the solution we have, and I'm sure you guys, you know this, as much as I do, uh, the amount of energy that you have available is proportional to the surface that you expose to the sun. So unless we use the same paradigm, uh, even if you have a hundred percent efficiency, you are limited by what the sun provides. So I'm sure if you want to fly clean, there will be other solution than the one we have. We wanted to have something uh, which which strikes the mind of people and having an airplane which can fly forever it's an incredible uh, it's an incredible thing so, I mean maybe you know we take it for granted but I tell you when you are over the middle of the Pacific and uh, if and you start to understand that uh, you fly uh, just because you get some sun rays on the wings and with the sun rays on the wings you can fly day and night for five days five nights I mean you you, you think you are you are uh, you are dreaming you don't think you I mean you, you don't think it's real real uh, you know sun rays are great but I mean to be able to fly day and night for me it's when I think about it it's incredible so our, our idea was to have a project that really strikes the mind of people to tell them that if we can be energy efficient in an airplane we can certainly be energy efficient on the ground and the potential is huge. Excellent. Any other questions from Berlin? <laughs> You're uh, uh, a bit shy, so I'll move on to, to Pierre and come back to you. Uh, Pierre, do you have any que questions for Andre? Hear me, and my connection is, is quite bad on my side. Um, I was I was just wondering what what are the the uh, altitudes between which uh, the solar impulse flies, and uh, during these daily oscillations, and how, how do you negotiate with the, uh, the 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 weather implication that has? Um, of course, over uh, over the Atlantic weather, it can be quite a challenge. And I was, uh, I was uh, just uh, just kind of wondering how. You know, from an operational point of view, uh, how is that uh, determined? Well, it doesn't make the life easy. You're absolutely right to say so. Uh, we oscillate between, let's say, five uh, five thousand feet to twenty-eight thousand feet. Uh, the goal is clear. It's a way to store energy. Uh, at night, to be lower uh, means we we'll use less energy. We, with the current technologies, it will be difficult to stay at 28,000 feet. Maybe with better batteries in the future, it's feasible. But for the time being, for us, it's uh, it's uh, it's not possible. Uh, but you're right to say that, in fact, we fly in three dimensions all the time. And you need the three-dimensional model to understand where the airplane will be, could be. When Bertrand took off yesterday, uh, he took off in blue sky in Kennedy, but bad weather was coming from the south, from uh, the sea, just at the at the uh, uh, the uh, latitude of uh, Washington, and uh, we had to go fast to the north, uh, not to be overtaken by this bad weather. Uh, so you use altitude to have the best speed. Uh, you need to climb at a certain stage to be able to store it. You have to understand what it means in terms of wind. You have to understand if it, you have clouds, if it reduces the energy collection. Uh, so constantly, in fact, we have engineers using uh, very sophisticated models to evaluate where the airplane could be, what the route is, uh, is the weather forecast stable, uh, do we run the risk to be in a situation where we uh, we don't have the energy uh, available and these for three, four, five days? So uh, I think modeling there, simulation is the only way. I think the human brain cannot grasp so many constraints, so many uh, so many information. And I think without these models, it would be pretty hard to make it uh, to make it safe. And finally, now this flight over the uh, Atlantic, we do it in less than three days. We use the winds. 
Uh, we have a S curve going to the north, coming back to the Azores, down south and up again. So it's a nice curve, but which uses all the benefits that nature can offer and maintaining Bertrand in the right weather conditions. Um, and actually, uh, I think I'm going to jump back to Berlin because um, I felt like I cut you guys off. So um, again, back to Berlin, Owen and, and uh, Theodore. Is it Theodore? Anyway, uh, you, you've got the floor. Thank you. No, first of all, we wanted to thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, we, we are all just sitting here in amazement that we're watching the first solar-powered flight across the Atlantic with a live internet connection. It's, uh, it's truly amazing. Uh, secondly, we, we were wondering, uh, similar to commercial flights, how much of the entire flight is uh, on autopilot and when uh, do you actually have to take control, uh, I assume for landing, for takeoff, but is there any other situation where the pilot has to take over the aircraft? Uh, in terms of flight controls, you have to realize that's an airplane which has I would say two personalities. When it's very calm, uh, you fly with two fingers. That's where, in fact, the stabilization system works very well. So we try to find situation. We try to find situation where the air is very uh, is very calm for the pilot to be able to sleep and rest. Um, when it starts to be turbulent, it's really hard work. I mean, you need sometimes full deflection of the flight controls. I mean, the worst situation I had, to give you an example, this was with the first airplane at the beginning, where we were building up experience, um, was uh, uh, in Brussels, and I was hit by turbulence, and during 12 seconds, I had full deflection of the elements, full deflection of the rudder, and at the same time the airplane made a 90 degrees turn on the other side. 12 seconds where you can't do anything, you just wait. So then of course the autopilot doesn't work, and uh, that's what we really try to avoid, it explains why we take off early, we land uh, late, we fly at very high altitude during the day to get away in fact from this turbulent situation. Uh, but it's an experimental airplane, you know, it's the first time that we were flying something so big, so light. There was no experience at the beginning, huh? no one had ever developed something like this. So we had to discover everything, we had to, to explore everything, step by step, slowly. And I think to have, to have two airplanes was really the right decisions because we could First, build up our experience. Second, modify the design so that you know we were close to what we thought was the best solution. Excellent. And I'm going to actually now. Uh, I hope you don't guys, you guys don't mind, but I'm going to yield the floor back to uh, Leopold. Um, uh, hello again. Do you have uh, some more questions for Andre? In Bertrand, there. Uh, he just was too busy to to, to cheer us, but it's a yeah. No, I'm afraid thing. actually the the um, he's he's the the picture's good, but the satellite uh, connection's a little bit bad, so we couldn't connect him. But he's he's definitely wishing you all well and saying hello in spirit. Yes, that's absolutely great, and I'm thrilled to to meet them in Seville. I will I will be there certainly. So I'm I'm really interested in uh, in seeing how 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 stub stubborn these these concepts of T taking on impossible challenges is going on here and I heard a couple of times the word of, of risk but risk is not something like it's not gambling you know you feel that there is a human brain behind human brains a team behind and I really I, I love this uh, this atmosphere it's a great message to the the oncoming engineers there that they have to build things together and, and, and take this this risk in their brain, this risk concept in their brains. And thank you, thank you, Andre, for sharing that with us today. Well, it's a great it's a great pleasure. But you're right to say at the end it's very much a question of mindset. Uh, uh, and you also have to have the right mix of people because I mean on one side you, you need people who are maybe like to go a bit further, on the other side you need people also to know where to stop and by confronting in fact their ideas you know you try to find ways the limit that should not go over. 
and to yeah. keep it to keep it safe. So it's a it's a balance, and everyone has a role to play, and it's very much a team, uh, really a teamwork, a team. Uh, a team spirit that you have to uh, that you have to develop for that, and probably that the the limit is set as as much by the human being that by the software. No, <laughs> probably. I mean, you have to combine both. Huh? You have to combine both. Sometimes you know the software is playing tricks that you don't understand, so you have to shut it off. <laughs> and uh, and that's the reason also why I wanted to have an airplane which was. Uh, capable to fly also with no electricity. I mean, if we needed to sh shut down everything, that's the flight controls was manual, that you could operate the landing gear manually, the air brakes, that if you had, as you, you know, in situation where you don't understand mm -hmm. where, and if you have a short circuit, that for safety reason, you can shut down everything, glide and land, and that's what this airplane is capable of, uh, of doing. So, yeah, you have to think all the time of, what can go wrong and be prepared for that. In some ways, it's also taking the anxiety away, you know, when you know that you can handle the worst, you don't think about it and you can concentrate on, the, on, uh, on being focused on what you have to do. Fantastic. Thank you, Actually, André. Well, I think uh, André has to, uh, he has to be on his way relatively soon from, from the MCC, um, and uh, we all have to get back to focusing on Bertrand, but thank you so much for all your questions and your interest, and uh, yes, and continue following Solar Impulse. All the best to you, huh? All it was the great best. talking to you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye Leopold. Okay. See you. C'est bien Photo Oui.